Okay, so uh, hello again, good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on your time zones. And uh, welcome to our webinar series, Navigating Legislation and the HIG Index. Uh, my name is Gabriele Vallero. I am Policy and Public Affairs Officer at Cascale. And today we're on our second edition of the HIC BRM with CSRD and more. So exciting. Uh, today we'll explore how the HIC brand and retail tool intersects with key pieces of legislation at EU level, like the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, CSRD, and the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, that's a mouthful, CSDDD. Um, so with that, we are thrilled that you're tuning in with, here, uh, with us today. And let's go with some quick housekeeping remarks for this webinar. Um, so due to the number of attendees, um, attendees will be muted during the presentation and the chat function will be turned off. So please ask your question using the Q&A function below during the webinar and feel free to upvote the most pressing or relevant questions. Um, and then we'll do our very best to address them all at the end. Um, so now a few words on the co-hosts of this webinar, which are Cascale and Worldly. Um, brief explanation on uh, who we are for those who don't know us yet. Um, so Cascale was formerly the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, and we are a global nonprofit alliance that empowers collaboration to drive equitable and restorative business practices in the consumer goods industry. We span over 300 retailers, brands, manufacturers, academia, industry association, nonprofits, and much more worldwide. Cascale members are united by a singular vision to give back more than we take to the planet and to its people. Cascale owns and develops the HIC Index, the most widely used standardized measurement framework across the consumer goods industry. Worldly is a supply chain sustainability data and insights platform that delivers the insights businesses insights businesses need to reduce their impact, comply with emerging regulatory and financial disclosure requirements, and meet the expectations of a new generation of customers. Worldly is the exclusive licensee of Cascales Higgs Index. Together, our organizations make the HIG Index possible, accessible and impactful for organizations serving the consumer goods industry with more than 24,000 HIG Index users worldwide today. So now on the agenda for today's session, um, we will start by navigating the legislative landscape. Uh, then we will move on to um, a few words on how uh, Worldly leverages data for uh, measurable progress. Um, then we will move over to an introduction uh, to the HIG brand and retail module, the BRM, and uh, ESRS in-depth analysis. We will uh, finish with next steps and the Q&A portion. So um, let's meet uh, our speakers. I am today joined by an amazing panel of speakers from Cascale and Worldly. Uh, first off, Elizabeth von Reitzestein, Senior Director, Public Affairs at Cascale. Um, J.R. Siegel, Vice President or of Sustainability at Worldly. <laughs> Hi, J.R. Um, Adrian Blanco, Senior Manager of the HIC Brand and Retail at Cascale. And last but not least, Maravillas Rodriguez Arco, uh, Senior Director of HIG Index Strategy and Operations at Cascale. Um, happy birthday, Maravilla, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> and now, without further ado, let's hear about CSRD and its link to CSDDD. Uh, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Um, so yes, starting with our first uh, first content slide on that, yeah, right. So uh, yeah, CSRD, what is it? The Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Um, yeah, probably known by all of you, probably feared by most of you. 
<laughs> we uh yeah, I just wanted to take a moment what what it actually mean, what it is. So um yeah, why it's there, yeah, its main objectives are to help investors, civil societies, organizations, consumers, and all other stakeholders or other stakeholders to evaluate and compare sustainability performance of companies. Um, it's also there to yeah, foster a culture of greater public accountability through high quality and reliable corporate reporting. So uh, yeah, what does what does this mean? Yeah. So um, it is um, it is also uh, there to uh, yeah what's well, required there to disclose, disclose detailed um, detailed qualitative and quantitative sustainability information on the risks and also opportunities again both uh, from social and environmental um, issues and the impact of the activities on the people and the environment. So this is the so-called double materiality. Um, also, what is also needed, but also part of the requirements, is to ensure the report information is verified through external audit, so so-called assurance. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, what does it mean timing-wise? Uh, so, Mam said have until July sixth um, to transpose the directive into national law. However, this will be um, gradual. So the timelines will uh, vary according to the size of company, which I will um, go into in a minute. Um, but just coming back on the timeline. So, I mean, this is something, this is set in law. However, we did talk to um, the European Commission yesterday and they did hint upon, uh, I should say, in case they're listening today, that um, not all of the member member states uh, might be meeting this deadline, so um, there might be a bit more wiggle room for for companies um, according according to that. Um, so yes, uh, coming to the coming to the next slide. Um, so uh, yes, this is this is the timeline. It looks very complex. However, we we try to lay down uh, basically what it means for what type of companies. Um, so uh, first of all, I mean for it's always the financial reports are always based on uh, like financial year of the previous year. Um, so for uh, like, yes, reports are due 2025 based on financial year of 2024. Um, and who is there in scope? These are company already subject to the current, like another uh, acronym, the NFRD. So this is the non-financial reporting directive. Um, so the, these companies already need to report uh, next year, um, and this includes also uh, large listed firms, uh, 500 more employees, public interest entities, banks, insurance companies. Um, and so, uh, yes, this the timeline varies further to the types of companies, um, which you can see see on the slide. Also, I do understand that the slides will also be shared afterwards, uh, so uh, don't... Uh, Yes, do, don't worry if you miss something here. Uh, so don't no need to take a screenshots or such. Um, so and uh, what are the required standards uh, we are talking about? So I, this is this is another area I would like to pause a moment on. So we do have the European Sustainability Reporting Standards or ESRS, which also will be covered a bit later in this um, webinar. Um, so they are for like in the years of twenty twenty five and twenty twenty six. Um, Whereas like then in uh, yeah 2027, we do um, expect timing pending and um, simplified ESRS for SMEs and sector specific um, ES, um, ESRS. Um, and uh, also on the reporting level, one consolidated report added uh, to the management section of your annual financial report in electronic uh, reporting format. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, with that, I uh, would already like to jump to the next slide, please. Um, so also, you know, as I said, what is important here is the are the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, ESRS. So what does it mean? What are they? Um, so reporting, they are essential reporting standards that companies must comply with under the CSRD. Um, they are developed by the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, EFRAC, another mouthful here. Um, and um, they are adopted by the European Commission through uh, so-called delegated acts. Delegated acts are 
is halt das Im and implement an act they are so called uh, tertiary as somebody says as sometimes we call it secondary legislation which do help to supplement existing legislation um in areas where we need more details basically um then what do the esis do uh, they outline the information that companies must report on uh, sustainability um and they define the reporting structure where applicable um, and there here, yeah, we have again the the timeline uh, which is relevant here. And of course, for uh, for this group of uh, audience, which is of course most interesting, is also the um, sector specific standards on textiles, accessories, footwear, and jewelry. Um, et voilà. So um, with that, we come to the next slide, please. Um, so on, yeah, who's Efrak and that I said, right? But also, um, I'm very happy to uh, share in this webinar that we are, um, we as Cascale are in fact collaborating with EFRAC. So um, it started uh, with um, the yeah, initial meeting in in November um, last year, um, where yeah, there was you know we we met them, uh, we we found there's uh, quite. A, quite a big room of common areas of interest and uh, stemming from this um a scale in in the form of uh, of uh, our colleague Adrian who is here today um are um, collaborating or contributing uh in the EFRAC framework to the sector specific ESRS for textiles apparel footwear accessories um since March of this year um so what does it mean uh, it means that we are uh, contributing to the research phase of the standards, um, which are currently under development by leveraging and bringing in our technical knowledge, best practices, and of course, like the, the industry insights uh, we as Cascale have for working uh, and uh, yeah, authoring the, the HIC index tools for, for years. Um, and yeah, the practical responsibilities include project management, Legislation review, standard mapping, providing these. Um, so yes, uh, with that, I also want to jump into like a next piece of legislation, which uh, Gabby also mentioned at the beginning. Um, so this is the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, uh, or CS Triple E, as as we call them in uh, in policy circles. Um, so um, so they are also there will be gradual implementation. Um, it's uh, so who is the first group uh, of companies in spoke will be large EU companies with uh, um, yeah 1,000 employees or more um, and a uh, global turnover of 450 million um, and large non-EU companies uh, with more than a 450 million euro turnover in the EU. Um, so yeah, it does not it does not um, apply in this first group to the companies who don't have any business in the EU, uh, which should be logical. But I just thought I I added um, for complete reasons. Um, then what does it do? Um, it introduces mandatory horizontal and cross sectoral due diligence obligations for companies. Um, so we say due diligence. Um, so this is uh, environmental and social due diligence. Um, why it's it's out there to hold companies accountable for their social and environmental impact throughout their chain of activities and will work alongside the CSRD um, for reporting on due diligence obligations. Um, when uh, final adoption uh, just has just happened uh, in May 2024, um, and it should most likely be applicable for as of June 2027 uh, for the first group of companies. Um, so coming to the next slide, um, so uh, this is uh, also the relevance in this webinar here today. Uh, so uh, yeah, how do they relate to each other? How do CSEE and CSRD relate to each other? So um, the CSEE focus um, on action for large companies to address environmental and human rights impacts in the value chain, upstream and also partially downstream. Um, and also requires companies to identify and mitigate adverse impacts, to develop a climate transition plan aligned with the Paris Agreement, and to co and communicate on due diligence um, efforts using ESRS. Then here's like the link 
Um, so uh, yes, so you see here um, also in the in the nice circles. Um, so uh, CSRD requires companies to disclose their due diligence processes, obligation to tell. Um, also, both of them in, uh, in companies in scope of both must describe their actions in their management report using ESIS. Um, and for CSEE, um, there's an obligation to act. So CSRD requires companies to act on due diligence. Um, so uh, yes, so to wrap up, um, I uh, I hope that you found this um, as useful. I uh, thank you very much. And with that, I would like to place the ball back in Gabi's field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, wow, that was uh, really a lot of new legislation to soak in, um, but really, really important to our members and, and HIG users. So yeah, up next, uh, we have some words on Worldly's deep collaboration with Cascale and industry partners to offer data-driven solutions to HIG BRM users' complex problems. So JR, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so Elizabeth did a great job of laying out sort of the legislative imperatives that we see in the EU with CSRD and CSDDD. And as she said, Cascal develops the HIG index, which, as most of you know, is the most widely used measure of environmental and social impacts across the apparel, footwear, and textile industries. And as a technology platform at Worldly, that's what we do. So we host that, we vend it, and we engage with all of our customers to really take advantage of all the amazing insights that they can generate through their use of the HIG index tools. And so to get a little bit more specific, what we do with that supply chain is we help deliver this real data that helps you understand your supply chain, your products, and your operations. And this is across a whole suite of impacts. We've listed several here, but emissions, energy consumption, water, waste, chemistry, and working conditions. Now, what's super important about this is that all of these are collecting primary data, and all of these serve as really critical inputs into both that obligation to tell and that obligation to act under the new EU legislative frameworks. Next slide. So there it is, CSRD. And when we look at CSRD, and we're gonna go through this in great detail in the second part of this webinar, but, but we really view CSRD as a roadmap for corporate sustainability for the, the next 10 years. So whether or not you need to adhere to CSRD today, if you're not big in Europe today, regardless, all of those different environmental, social and governance sections and the way that it's framed and all the data that you need to really show that momentum, it's a really great thing for anybody who's a sustainability professional to be using as a North Star, regardless of if or when your company needs to comply with CSRD. Cool. And so where this all comes together with the HIG index and worldly is this emphasis that the CSRD has on measurable progress. It's again, this duty to act and to tell. And so obviously primary data is a great way to understand those impacts that you have but it's not just about where you are today. It's about the progress. It's about how you're moving towards adhering to that 1.5 degree goal for the Paris Agreement. It's about that work over time. And so to show your progress over time, you really need primary data. If you're relying on proxy data or secondary data, it's gonna be really hard to demonstrate all the great work that you're doing within your supply chain. So we really view the structured efficient data collection as a critical input to CSRD compliance both to comply with the legislation, but also to adhere to the principles that underlie it and the intention behind it. Next slide. And so just a little bit of how our tools can help you prepare. So many of the HIG index tools kind of at this industry standard tooling for, for our core industries can help companies collect this data that you need to adhere to CSRD and CSDDD. And so three that, that we'll speak to is the HIG BRM, um, Adrian and Meravi are going to go really deep on that later, so I'll pause and not do much on that. But there's also the HIG FEM, which is this facility environmental module, which is a annual assessment that really helps companies gather a ton of quantitative and qualitative data around their supply chain impacts. And then there's a new part of this HIG Netics tool, which is the facility data manager, which gathers much of the quantitative data available within the HIG FEM, 
but is doing it on a more consistent basis. So the cadence is monthly as opposed to annual data. Thank you. With that, I will hand the floor back to Gabrielle. Thank you. Thank you so much, JR. Uh, just a reminder for our attendees, uh, please remember to submit your questions and upvote the most relevant or pressing ones in the Q&A uh, button right below. Uh, well, good. Up next, uh, let's unpack the potential of the HIG BRM and how the tool will support members and users with CSRD compliance. Uh, Adrian Maravi, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, before we begin our detailed analysis to, of the ETHRS, uh, I would like to introduce the HIG brand and retail model to those who may not be familiar with it. Next slide, please. Uh, the HIPRM is a self-assessment tool built on an ESG framework, specifically developed for textile, apparel, and footwear. It evaluates the entire supply value chain from raw materials to the end of life, providing a comprehensive view of the sustainability journey. The HPRM standardized assessment process and facilitates a uniform approach across the industry. This uniformity is crucial for benchmarking, enabling companies to compare their sustainability metrics directly against those of their peers. Moreover, the BRM enhances transparency. It achieves this through uh, the consistent of uh, verified data, which is uh, critical in building trust within the industry. Ultimately, the goal of the HPRM is to drive positive impact. It encourages improvements in sustainability practices by highlighting areas of strength and pinpointing opportunities for enhancement. This support helps companies uh, to develop more effective sustainability strategies. Additionally, the BRM aids in fulfilling reporting obligations, as we will explore in this webinar. Next slide. So, what are the main implications? Uh, next slide, yeah, uh, for companies with PSRD and how they will affect them. In the next slide, uh, we show, in this slide, we show the change in sustainability reporting brought by the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive compared with the previous one, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive. While the Non-Financial reporting, uh, uh, financial reporting Directive was a positive step towards sustainability report being, uh, reporting had limitations, uh, companies had flexibility in choosing the frameworks, leading to a lack of consistency, and uh, the reported information was also not always comparable due to the absence of a standardized format. Additionally, the non-financial uh, report directive only applied to a uh, limit a uh, number of larger companies. PSRD aims to address these shortcomings by introducing mandatory ESRS that provides a more specific and structured approach to reporting. Additionally, the requirement for electronic reporting and mandatory verification will further enhance the comparability and credibility of sustainability information. This change will benefit the stakeholders like investors and consumers who rely on this information to make informed decisions. However, it's important to acknowledge that transitioning to CSRD may pose challenge for some companies especially with regards to adopting new standards and mandatory verification. So let's move to delve into the in-depth analysis of the ESRS. Uh, so I'm at uh, the stage with your Maravi, please. Um, thank you, Adrian, and hi, everyone. So um, the, the main purpose of this webinar is to provide you with the necessary information and insights on how the HIG BRM can support you um, in your reporting obligations and their CSRD. We know that the BRM is not a reporting tool. However, its extrinsic characteristics can play a very relevant role in supporting you in your reporting journey. So um, the content that we will share in the next slides is organized following the same structure as the ESRS. We understand that you probably I mean, if you're in this webinar, you probably know the ESRS, you probably are subject to report, and you um, have the ESRS document on your desk as you go to reference um, document, and probably you have read that document a number of times or will read it many, many times. So in any case, we believe the best way to demonstrate how the BRM can support you is by using 
this family extractor to you. So what we're going to do is follow the ESRS extractor. Um, and in this section, we will, in each section, we will highlight what we consider are the most relevant topics and explain how the BRM can assist you with that specific topic. So that is going to be the extractor for the next slides. Um, next slide. As I just mentioned, this is how the ESRS are structured, and this is the structure we will follow in the next slides. So we will start with ESRS 1, followed by ESRS 2 general disclosures, and finally by the topical standards. Next slide. Um, so let's start with uh, ESRS 1 um, and the requirements. Next slide, please. Yeah, we, we're going to start with ESRS 1 and the requirements that you will have to follow in your reporting that are listed under this section. Next slide. Okay, double materiality. Probably one of the main challenges companies will face is the requirement of a double materiality assessment. The ESRS requests an assessment of both impact materiality and financial materiality. Impact materiality means understanding if a sustainability matter is material from an impact perspective, affecting people or environment. And financial materiality involves assessing the materiality of sustainability matters that can generate risks or opportunities affecting the company from a financial perspective. Okay, so that's it, the, the double materiality. It seems quite complex, but once that you read through it, it's kind of simple. So if we go to the next slide, what the BRN can do for you, the support that the BRN can provide is with the impact materiality, okay? Um, the BRM places a special emphasis on assessing impacts throughout the entire value chain. This is important because we're talking about impacts and this is what the BRM does. We assess impacts. Um, and second, the BRM is an industry specific framework and has an ESG structure. And this is important because as a result of this, the BRM covers the most relevant material issues for industry. So if a particular impact is included in the BRM, it is likely to be considered material. Conversely, if it is not covered, it is probably not material. Practically speaking, you can use the BRM as a guide, following it pillar by pillar, section by section, and question by question. You can identify all the topics that are material for our industry and sh and 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 and. and, and um, topics that should be considered in your materiality assessment. Okay, that's it. It's kind of simple if you think of it. Um, not so simple when you have to do it, but the BRM can um, provide a really, really huge support here to all of you. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, the next relevant um, topic that we want to highlight from ESRS1 is the structure of the sustainability statement. Um, the ESRS are very, very clear when it comes to the structure of, a, of the sustainability statement. Um, the idea, I mean, for this is to promote and enhance consistency in the way companies structure their reporting. So you cannot structure uh, the way your uh, communication or marketing team wants to articulate your reporting, that is not how it's going to work. Uh, what you're seeing in this slide is the specific structure that ESRS requires. And when we talk about sustainability statement, we're referring to your reporting, um, your, your report, your sustainability report. Um, so you have to structure it in this way. I mean, th that's it. That's what ESRS requires. So um, if we go to the next slide, what do I do if I don't have um, a lot of um, reporting experience or if even though I have reporting experience, I don't really know where to begin with all these uh, complex uh, ecosystem environment and, uh, and tons of information that I need to articulate and structure. 
well, this is where the BRM can, again, support you. Um, as you can see in this slide, um, the structure of the HIG BRN questionnaire aligns with the, for, with the format required uh, for the sustainability statement. So you're saying e ESRS codification, you see this, um, you see here BRM impact areas, you see it's almost one for one. So, um, so the structure are uh, really, really, really uh, aligned. And this alignment uh, was enhanced during the last major update of the Higbiaran questionnaire because we developed that version of the of the uh, BRM with the ESRS structure in mind. We anticipate to, to the CSRD coming. And, and actually it incorporates all the relevant topics, but through the lens of industry specificity, this is our value. Um, Okay, so practically speaking, um, if we go back to the previous slide, yeah. So practically speaking, um, when you when you need to collect information in an structured way, okay, this is what you need to do to structure your sustainability statement. You first need to collect information in an structured way. And then you need to articulate all this information following a specific format the one required by SRS. All these processes can be a bit overwhelming, as I said, and you might not know where to start, what topics to include under which sections. However, by following the HIG BRM questionnaire, again, stage, section by section, question by question, you will gather that information in an structured and organized manner. And after that, all you need to do is follow the same structure to articulate the sustainability statement. Summarizing, if the information gathered is structured according to the BRM taxonomy and the undertakings, all of you companies that need to report undertakings, draft their sustainability statement following this structure, your sustainability statement naturally will align with the structure required by SRS. So, I hope this is clear because this is important. The BRM can be your guide to structure your sustainability statement. You just need to follow the BRM taxonomy. So, yeah, next slide. Um, okay, next one on our list of uh, relevant topics that we want to highlight in ESRS1, entity-specific disclosures. What is this? Um, Okay, the ESRS is an agnostic standard and it acknowledges its limitation. And at the same time, um, underscores the importance of entity-specific disclosures. This means that the ESRS is telling you that it is important to capture aspects that are not covered by the ESRS. And you need to make those integral to your sustainability statement. So how can I do it? I need to report following ESRS. I know ESRS is an agnostic standard, but at the same time, ESRS is telling me, well, you should be able to identify those material topics that are material to your industry and include those into your sustainability statement. Well, um, how do I do it? If we go to the next slide, here, the BRM presents a unique opportunity um, to disclose this type of information because uh, the BRM provides depth and granularity to um, material topics that are critical within our industry, topics that the ESRS or other industry agnostic frameworks may not cover adequately. So um, something that we need to have clear um, in this section is that um, the ESRS uh, has a lot of information around the quality of information, but this quality of information primarily concerns to how the entity discloses this information. But in any case, and in this context, the BRM, it is really close with ESRS um, in terms of comparability and relevance, and it really excels 
in supporting companies because um, these alignments may um, well, or, or allow that your disclosures um, are not only comprehensive, but also robust and reliable. A practical example of what I'm saying. Imagine that um, you are what you are, a company in the textile uh, apparel and footwear industry, and you need to um, disclose entity-specific uh, disclosures. A practical example would be purchasing practices. This is not covered by ESRS, but the BRM offers detailed insights into purchasing practices that are essential for assessing the sustainability of the supply chain, and you need to include that. Uh, for example, uh, related to chemical management, if we talk about restricted uh, substances list, RSL or MRSL, same. VRM provides a, spe a special focus to these two topics. So um, you can highlight uh, what you need through the BRM. Um, and again, the BRM is really, really useful when others, uh, industry agnostic uh, framers uh, cannot uh, get. Next slide. Value chain. Um, this is the last uh, relevant topic that we want to um, highlight in ESRS1. Um, the value chain uh, chapter emphasizes the importance of understanding and disclosing the full range of activities from product conception, raw material to end of life encompassing both upstream and downstream processes. And it mandates that entities identify and disclose their value chain boundaries, covering all significant sustainability impacts, risks, and opportunities. And this includes ensuring data collection is reliable and engaging with value chain partners to enhance the quality and, and scope of um, reporting. The BRM, uh, is not a tool that will help you um, in at assessing impacts across, um, I mean, the, the VRM will help you at assessing impacts across your whole value chain, but it won't, it won't be enough to, um, to gather all the quantitative data you'll need upstream. For that, we really encourage you to explore other HIG index tools, such as FEM or MSI. Um, and next slide. Um, okay. As a summary of, of, of what we have seen, what we have shared in this uh, first section, ESRS1. Um, here you can see very, very, um, a, a, a very, in a very summarized way, how the BRM can provide specific support. Double materiality, it is covered by the BRM and the specific support is the BRM provide industry, is, is actually an industry specific guidance to identify material matters. Sustainability statement, it is covered by the HIG BRM, yes. And the specific support is to, to, uh, is to serve as the structure to follow when you're structuring the sustainability statement. The BRM taxonomy can do that for you. Entity-specific disclosures, we cover in the BRM, and the specific support is that the BRM framework can be used to identify those industry-specific material matters that are not covered by the SRS, but you have to disclose. And finally, value chain. We know that the BRM um, cannot cover um, and cannot support you on that. We want to highlight it. Uh, but at the same time, um, we can help you assess impacts. But if you, when you need to uh, collect your primary data, please explore the use of other HIG index tools because it's really, really important. Um, and finally, and with that, I, I will um, I will leave it again to you, Adrienne. But before that, um, um, our colleagues from Worldly, they have drafted um, a fantastic white paper that you should read if you want to understand how the he in the suite of tools, not only the BRM, we're going deeper here, 
But with the rest of the Hay Index tools, you can find very useful information on that uh, white paper that Wardley published, um, I don't know, a couple of months ago, three months ago, the beginning of this year. I don't know, but you can uh, find them in their website. And with that, Jeremy, oh, Jeremy, sorry, Jeremy's not here. It's important, but it's not here. With that, Adrian, uh, over to you. Thank you, Maravi. Um, so let's uh, <laughs> go in deeper and deeper in this analysis and let's move to the cross-cutting standards in ESRS2 and their requirements. So in this section, we will visit three out of four uh, reporting areas. Uh, we are not going to talk about the strategy since out, it's, it is out of the scope of the BRM and focus our attention in the other three. Next slide, please. Um, ESRS uh, to place governance at the head of, of uh, company sustainability reporting. This section goes beyond just disclosing the policy. Um, it demands transparency on how sustainability is truly integrated into a company's decision making and oversight processes. This sh shift towards uh, holistic integration is crucial for building trust with the stakeholders who are increasingly focused on a company's tuning. Uh, commitment to e ESG goals. So the HIPRM guides companies in establishing these robust governance structures. It provides a framework for outlining the uh, board structure and the composition, ensuring that the board expertise is sustainable and is not only present but effective. By following and completing the related questions uh, that you can find in the, um, in the structure and management and general section of the governance pillar, you can assess the strength of your governance mechanisms in relation to sustainability, enabling you in case your company lacks some relevant aspects, aspects of the same to build a stronger governance foundations without starting from scratch. It covers everything from board responsibilities and knowledge to incentive scheme or oversight mechanisms ensuring that when it's time to report, you have well-structured content with all the necessary documents and evidence to support your reporting obligations. This comprehensive approach ensures that the governance reporting is not only aligned with ESRS requirements, but also embedded in the very fabric of your organization operations, making sustainability a cornerstone of uh, corporate governance. Next slide, please. Another area to focus on is the process of identifying the impacts, risks, and opportunities of material topics. This plays a crucial role in supporting companies as they integrate sustainability into every aspect of their operations, from strategy and decision-making to governance practices. The IRO framework is repeated across the topical ESRS as a foundational practice similar to the uh, BRM employees through the general section of each pillar. The BRM here guide, you, uh, guide companies in understanding their impacts, identifying potential risks and recognize opportunities for improvement with, uh, along the questionnaire. Each general section evaluates how sustainability efforts go beyond mere compliance and are genuinely integrated into the day-to-day -day decision making processes. This integration is crucial, again, as it ensures that sustainability is not just a checkbox, uh, but a strategic element influencing every business decision. The VRM fosters a comprehensive reflection uh, process that is essential for detailed evaluation of impact and risks. VRM assists companies in assessing potential risks associated with their activities within the value chains and engaging key stakeholders to incorporate diverse practice uh, perspectives from both inside and outside of the organization. BRM supports the identification and prioritization of those risks to optimize resources allocation and management efforts, ensuring that companies are proactive, not merely reactive in their approach. This proactive approach is further enhanced by the BRM's methodology, which is consistent across each pillar and impact area, ensuring not critical aspects are overlooked. The necessity of this process cannot be overstated and must be conducted regularly. The dynamic landscape of the industry, changing re uh, regulatory shifts, operational changes, and significant external events demands that we remain responsive and adapt adaptive. 
This adaptiveness is crucial, supported by the VRM, which provides a structured framework and a checklist of essential elements necessary for a strong evaluation of the impacts and risks associated with a company's activity. Next slide, please. If we began this uh, section of cross-cutting standards by emphasizing the importance of a good governance to effectively integrate the sustainability strategy into the daily decision-making as a core part of foundational approach, and uh, next we discuss the IDO framework, which aids organizations in identifying where risk and opportunities lie in an ongoing process. Now, we will delve into the minimum disclosure requirements which are crucial for demonstrating how a company manages its material sustainability matters. Unlike traditional reports that might simply state policies, minimum disclosure requirements require a comprehensive disclosure of actions, metrics, and targets. This level of detail is essential as it allows the stakeholders to accurately assess a company's commitment and effectiveness in the sustainability initiative. In this context, the HIT BRM serves as a practical tool that closes align with the uh, minimal disclosure requirement approach. Let's examine the companies of those as they relate to the BRM. When we are talking about the policies, the BRM not only evaluate them, uh, adopt uh, how the companies adopt uh, to manage their sustainability matters, but also provides a clear guidance on what these policies should encompass. It defines uh, the requirements for robust policies and explains how they should be interconnected to address the multifaceted nature of sustainability. Peak PRM evaluate, evaluation uh, is uh, this. Sorry, this evaluation is part of the due diligence steps within each pillar, ensuring that the policies are not only appropriate but also effective implementing, covering all necessary topics in a clear and direct manner. The BRM is uh, actively supporting the development of actions within each impact area. Um, the implementation and result questions ensure that these actions are not just planned, but uh, are executed and lead to tangible sustainability outcomes. KBRM provides examples, guidance on actionable steps com uh, a company can take to reduce impacts, mitigate potential risk, and capitalize on opportunity thereby facilitating a strong sustainability strategy that addresses the main material concern. Metrics and targets are essential for monitoring the effectiveness of uh, policy and actions. Within the VRM, these are specified in the measurement and results. And targets, sorry. VRM aids in defining how good targets should be uh, designed as a smart ones, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. It also supports how they should be interlinked with the uh, policies and risks in encouraging companies to measure progress towards these targets and mile milestones systematically. Both minimal disclosure requirements and HIPRM share foundational elements in policy, action, and metrics and targets. These elements are reiterated within the topical ESRS as part of a comprehensive due diligence process embedded in both frameworks. By adding to the BRM, with its detailed guidance, examples, and tailored questions, companies are well prepared to meet these uh, disclosure requirements. Next slide, please. In our journey through ESRS2, we have uh, dissected the pivotal areas where the HIPRM plays an instrumental role in enhancing our sustainability reporting and compliance practices. We have started with uh, governance. Uh, here, the BRM not only guides, but empowers us to create and implement robust sustainability governance structure. It ensures these frameworks are well integrated into strategic decision-making processes. And this alignment is crucial as it transforms governance from a mere compliance requirement to a strategic asset, deeply embedded in our everyday business practices. Moving to impact risks and opportunities, here the HIPRM demonstrates its systematic strength. It supports on ongoing efforts to evaluate and manage sustainability-related risks and opportunities. Using the BRM, uh, by using the BRM, we adopt a proactive approach to sustainability, positioning our organization to anticipate changes and adapt the strategies swiftly and effectively. Lastly, regarding the minimum disclosure requirements, the uh, BRM provides a detailed guidance that helps us develop comprehensive disclosure 
disclosure. Uh, those disclosures encompass policies, actions, and targets laying a clear pathway for transparency and accountability that meet ESRS standards. The BRMC structure approach ensures that every significant aspect of our sustainability practices is not only documented, but also strategically aligned with our long-term goals. The HIC BRM serves as a vital tool uh, guiding us through each of these cr uh, critical aspects of sustainability report. It ensures that our efforts are impactful, measure, measured, and continuously improving. So let's continue with the topical standards and going even deeper in this mapping. Um, next slide. Next slide. Before delving into the specific of our mapping task, I would like to explain why we have uh, undertaken a detailed mapping and outline the criteria we have used for mapping against the topical ESRS. The rationale behind of our comprehensive making effort is to provide a peace of mind that the BRM covers a significant portion of the ESRS. The BRM serves not merely as a checklist, but uh, as a strategic tool that guides and strengths our sustainability journey. It's designed to ensure that our sustainability strategy is robust, helping us navigate to the complexity of ES, uh, ESG requirements effectively. Our mapping has revealed around 65% alignment with the ESRS, um, and it's a good achievement from our perspective. Um, this figure uh, we find quite satisfactory given the nature of our tool. The BRM is primarily a performance assessment tool, not a quantitative reporting tool, and therefore is, it naturally focuses more on qualitative insights. Also, the BRM aligns with our identity as an impact organization, and it assesses only the impact materiality, leaving the financial out of the scope. As we continue to refine and update the BRM, we aim to bridge any existing gaps with ESRS, effectively elevating this uh, tool utility and supporting our users in meeting rigorous standards. Next slide, please. In our approach to mapping the BRM against the ESRS, we have gone beyond simple question by question comparison to adopt a more comprehensive and in-depth methodology. This process involves uh, through examination of the BRM's questions, the un available answer options, the detailed guidance provided, and the required evidence. A realistic approach ensures we understand the full depth and breadth of each question, enabling a comprehensive coverage of all sustainability aspects. The BRM is primarily perform a performance assessment tool, structured to demand the same level of preparedness of as a reporting tool, and it requires a robust supporting documentation and evidence, paralleling the rigorous demands of reporting frameworks. This preparation not only facilitates compliance with the BRM, but also aligns close with the ESRS requirements. Through our detailed mapping, we have found that the completing the BRM prepares organization effectively for ESRS compliance. In fact, a significant portion of the disclosure requirements are already addressed by the thorough documentation and evidence collected during the BRM assessment process. By using the BRM, companies can ensure that they have not only met a large percentage of disclosure requirements, but also that they have the necessary documentation and strategic uh, insights to articulate their sustainability narrative. This makes the task of integration BRM findings into ESRS reporting much simpler allowing companies to collaborate effectively with their communication teams to craft compelling sustainability disclosures. Next slide, please. The next two slides provide a summary of uh, how effectively the HIC BRM frameworks align with the topical ESRS. These slides offer both a visual and quantitative analysis of the extent of the coverage, clearly del uh, delineating which aspects are addressed which are not, which fall out of, uh, outside of the BRM's scope, and which are not applicable to our industry. As highlighted in the discussion on double materiality, we are primarily an impact-focused organization. Therefore, certain financial-related discussion require, requires naturally by fall outside the BRM's scope. Moreover, as we have reiterated through, uh, through today's presentation, 
those data points not currently covered are under review and we will integrate in the future updates to better serve the needs of the VRM users. I would like to draw your attention to the significant overlap we have identified in areas like water or uh, resource use and circular economy. Um, and in the uh, next slides, I will uh, delve deeper in the topic uh, climate coverage. Moving to the next slide, which addresses social and governance aspects, you can see that the overall performance is commendable with an outstanding 91% overlap in the workers section, which we'll explore in more detail later in this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, uh, in more detail, um, uh, let's focus on climate. Climate, as you all know, plays a pivotal role in the synchronizing with the European Union's ambitious environmental objectives. As we are all aware, climate change mitigation is not just a component, but a cornerstone of the European agenda, which aims for climate neutrality by 2050 as part of the broad, uh, broader Green Deal strategy. This initiative extends beyond mere emission reduction, aiming to integrate net zero targets across all sectors by mid-century. As we delve deeper into our mapping effort, it's important to know that the coverage uh, statistics we have achieved in the climate are around 45, but if we put in, in relative terms, uh, uh, it translates to uh, 57%. This figure is particularly noteworthy uh, considering that much of the remain aspects pertain to carbon credits, a focus area still maturing uh, and not uh, in, in, in our daily, daily work and detailed quantitative data that are beyond the current scope of our uh, tool. Next slide. The VM guides companies in focusing on areas where they can create the most impact. It offers examples and initiatives that companies can implement to reduce their DOG emissions. This includes evaluating how they engage with their suppliers to effectively address the DOG emissions challenge. The VM, the VM also prompts companies to reflect on the ways, uh, for example, the ways they transport goods, integrating this consideration into their broader transition plans to miti mitigate climate impact. All these elements contribute to building a strong, a comprehensive strategy for climate action. However, while the VRM establishes a foundational framework for a strategic shift towards the 2050 goal, it currently lacks comprehensive support in some areas. To address these gaps, we have identified several immediate uh, next steps, like revising the questions related to the energy, uh, bringing more support uh, into detail that are required, or uh, in terms of uh, energy consumption and efficiency. And for example, <clears throat> we are going to evaluate and enhance the guidance on transition and mitigation plans to provide more context, uh, contextual guidance and crafting uh, uh, and reporting transition plans. Next slide, please. So, and now turning our focus on the workers section, it is important to recognize that the role that uh, this topic plays in the sustainability strategy. The European Union emphasizes a company's responsibility to understand and manage the social impacts through its entire value chain. This is not just about compliance. It's about aligning with the union's broader commitment to ethical business conduct and the enhance of the sust uh, social sustainability. In essence, uh, proper management of workers-related issues is pivotal in building resilient and responsible supply chains that contribute positively to society. In terms of coverage, our mapping efforts reveal a high alignment with the uh, VRM covering 91% of, of the work-related requirements. Notably, the VRM goes beyond the ESRS by including a detailed subset of questions related to the purchasing practices, which, while extremely material to our industry, are not uh, covered by ESRS. Next slide. The VRM provides actionable guidance that help companies take positive actions or minimize negative impacts concerning workers in the uh, supply chain. It addresses the most pertinent concerns by facilitating the identification and management of potential risks. The structured questions and detailed guidance within the VM enable companies to effectively engage with their suppliers, ensuring that workers' welfare is prioritized and improved continuously. <clears throat> 
Despite the high level of alignment and the proactive approach in supporting worker-related initiatives, there are always opportunities to enhance our tools and ensure they remain on uh, the forefront of sustainability reporting requirements. Here we have also an opportunity to uh, for the entity-specific disclosure that uh, Maravis mentioned uh, before uh, regarding the responsible purchasing practices, and it's an opportunity for any organization to to um, to use the BRM for improve and and uh, add this uh, material impact into their report uh, reporting. Next slide, please. To conclude, the CSRD is setting a new standard for sustainability, emphasizing two critical aspects, transparency and progress. The directive aims to ensure that companies not only disclose their sustainability practices clearly, but also demonstrate continuous improvement in their sustainability performance. This push is designed to make sustainability efforts both visible and measurable encouraging companies to embed these practices in their strategy and operations. By completing the BRM, companies are already taking significant steps towards meeting the ESRS requirements. The BRM facilitates a comprehensive disclosure of sustainability practices through a structured questions that require detailed answer, ensuring nothing is overlooked. Completing the BRM means you are proactively engaged in the practices that ESRS is advocating for. And the BRM not only focuses your efforts, but also assists you and supports you in integrating these practices in your business operation. As for progressing sustainability efforts, the BRM is instrumental in guiding companies on this journey. It not only highlights current practices, but also identifies areas of, for improvement, allowing companies to make informed decisions about where to allocate resources for maxima, uh, maximum impact. The BRM's action-oriented approach helps companies to not just plan, but actively implement strategies that reduce environmental impact, improve social responsibility, and strengthen governance. And now I give back the floor to Maravi. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. So uh, to finalize this um, section, we would like to share with you the two immediate next steps that we're going to take. First one is we're going to publish a white paper exclusively on HIGBRM and CSRD. Um, following this webinar in the next uh, coming weeks, we will um, share with all of you the white paper that we'll have uh, mainly a little explanation on how the BRM supports companies in their reporting obligations and their CSRD. Kind of what you have seen in this webinar, but with more details and um, and expanding a bit the scope on a few topics. Uh, we will also we will also share with all of you, um, with together with this white paper, the detailed mapping between BRM and ESRS, so you can uh, access to it and use it as a guidance. Um, and the next step, also immediate next step is to improve the alignment between BRM and ESRS. Um, as Adrian mentioned, the current overlap is 65%. We know that we're not going to be able to reach to 100% alignment, mainly because two reasons. First one is because there are topics that are not material for the BRM, and we're, we, we cannot include those in, in our questionnaire. For example, financial uh, matters. We are an impact organization. The BRM um, is uh, a performance assessment tool that assesses impacts. So we are not uh, going to cover financial matters. That is not material for us. That's one thing. And the other thing is uh, those um, topics covered by the ESRS that are not um, covered by the, that, that are not material for us. Um, we're not going material for our industry. We're not going to include those into the BRM. So we 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 won't have this 100 percent alignment. We won't have to. I mean, that's not the idea. The idea is to say as an industry um specific framework. Um and we will do that probably uh in two different ways. We will expand and add more detailed explanations to the guidance, the how to hit guidance. 
and we will let a few questions uh, in sections where those uh, questions are required. Those questions will be non-scored questions. Uh, the reason why, because we want the VRM to remain compatible with the previous versions. We want VRM 2022, 2023, 2024 to remain compatible so you can track your progress, so you can compare the scoring, so you can um, use the benchmarking uh, feature that we provide in a, in an adequate uh, manner. So uh, VRM will remain compatible. And, um, and that's it. This, th that's all from our side. And I think it's uh, back to you, Gabriel. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much, Adriana Maraví. Um, and also a big thank you to all of our uh, amazing speakers today for this presentation. Okay, now time for some questions. Uh, let's uh, see some of our uh, upvoted questions submitted by the audience. We are going to start for the most upvoted ones. So um, maybe uh, Adrian, will the textile sector specific standards alter the reporting under the current ESRS? Will it be one or the other, or will it be an addition to the general ESRS? Um, most probably the, the way they are going to um build that is similar to other standards like GRI is doing with the industry specific. And it will be like, if there is a specific um, a standard for your sector, then you can uh, you should uh, go to that one because they will um, encompass and, and focus the, 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 the material matters of, of the industry uh, in a better way. Uh, but it doesn't mean that all the effort that you are doing with the current agnostic one or the generic one, let's say, uh, will be uh, something that uh, uh, is going to be um, um, useless uh, from that day on. Actually, um, is is a uh, effort that you have done, and and most probably most of the the um, the data requirements will be the same. Just maybe adding more granularity or more close to the entity specific that uh, we have mentioned during the call. One of the examples that we mentioned was, for example, chemical management, right? Today, um, uh, the, the agnostic is, is talking about uh, pollution and substance of high concern. And uh, potentially um, some uh, brands are not uh, uh, well understand or addressing the way to uh, how to include here, for example, RSL, uh, rest restricted substance list or MRSL in the supply chain because it seems somehow it's unclear. So the expectation is that the industry specific one, the for the textile, will address this subtopic, subtop, subtopic sorry, uh, more in a clear way. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's like yeah. that. Very, very clear. Thank you, Adrian. Um, next most voted question is for uh, you, JR, I guess. They are... Um, Requesting for you to share the link for Worldly's white paper. Um, you want to say a couple of words on that? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, um, thanks for the interest. Uh, the, the best way to do this is to go to our website, uh, worldly.io, and then slash general dash inquiry. And in that inquiry, in the open text, just say you're interested in receiving a copy of the CSRD white paper. Um, the reason for that is, as you've heard through the webinar today, this is a highly nuanced and complex space. And so we just want to make sure that everybody who downloads that white paper, we have a chance to engage with more systematically, answer any questions, and give that kind of next layer from what you heard today about how the tools can help you meet your compliance. So super thrilled to talk to anybody about it, but that's the, that's the three-step process. All right. Thank you, JR. Um... Now, next question, uh, probably for Maravi or Adrian. Uh, can you break down again how minimum disclosure requirements and the BRM relate? Does it mean that when a company reports on topics covered on in the BRM, this then will assure that the company meets minimum disclosure requirements? So the minimum disclosure requirements is um, uh, set some uh, 
minimum uh, elements that you have to disclose. And here, what um, the VRM can support you is, for example, uh, understand which are the, the needs that you need to have for uh, having a valid policy, for example, or how this policy should be um, linked with the, with the targets and everything. And this is already uh, covered by the, by the VRM because in the way the VRM is built, it allows you to interconnect um, um, the, the policies with the targets somehow is guiding you, taking you by the hand and helping you to understand uh, how you should establish your uh, targets, how they should be established, and smart targets always, uh, as I mentioned, and, and uh, linking with the policy. Like, it uh, makes no sense to have a policy that is not addressing any kind of the potential actions that, for example, are uh, being disclosed uh, through the VRM. And in, in, in the way, if you... Read in a, in uh, or you follow the VRM is in a, as a whole and a comprehensive comprehensive tool. You can understand that how you should address some actions to, for example, mitigate the the GSD emission should be uh, interconnected with the policy and how you have to establish the targets and the middle middle milestones maybe uh, until to the main goal, which is the 2050. So in that way is how the VRM is helping you by completing the VRM. You have this. Uh, three, uh, the, this 360 uh, overview on, on the way to interconnect everything uh, in an easier way rather than uh, trying to build something from zero to scratch or maybe um, spending a lot of time with consultancies and everything when in the VM you have already this already in a slow way. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Um, the next question, I think we all, uh, Maravi already covered it in her uh, in her uh, part. So let's move to the last one. Um, are those areas the ones you covered in the comparison tables in the slides? Um, I think they so. For example, strategy, which is not covered. In your opinion, how can company how can a company currently address the aspects that are not covered? So I think. This question is again related to that 35% of non-coverage and they are asking how can a company currently address these aspects that are not covered. So Maravi or Adrian, okay. whoever wants to take Do you want to take that one, Adrian? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, first of all, this 35% of uh, not being covered is not really 35% because it's less, as, as we mentioned. Part of those uh, percentage belongs to uh, um, uh, questions related to financial materiality, which is out of the scope of the VRM. So in real, the coverage of the VRM is, is higher if we are only uh, uh, looking into the material um, uh, impact material. Uh, so it's, it's uh, much uh, less the, the, the non-cover situation. And for the non-cover ones, um, most, most of the non-cover uh, uh, topics are related to a specific uh, quantitative um, uh, data that, uh, as, again, PRM is not a, a reporting tool or a gathering uh, data tool. It's a uh, self-assessment or performance assessment tool. Uh, and the strength of the PRM is not only uh, helping you to, to uh, uh, understand how are you, it's also in a more strategic point of view, guiding you, supporting you, and uh, elevating you to a more uh, strong uh, uh, sustainability strategy. So saying that, we acknowledge that there is some uh, potential gaps in terms of um, a further alignment on the, the requirements uh, that um, the ESRS has, and we want to evaluate how can we um, uh, elaborate that to incorporate into the VRM uh, without um, without changing the the nature of the VRM itself. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so um, in the, I don't know if I if I answer the question. Let me write again because I maybe I lost some time. I saw something. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's is already answered. Those uh, there are certain things that is out of the scope of the VRM, 
um, um, also because this is a strategic point of view that a, a, a organization should have, and we cannot uh, stay in how they should do and conduct that one. Also, um, I would like to add that, for example, um, th these uh, um, um, attendees asking for strategy, which is not covered um, in the VRM, as as you saw in the slides, um, is not really. Um, there's no really. A, a, a specific reporting tool that is going to help you in structuring, um, not in structuring, the VRM is going to help you in structuring, is not going to help you understand the deepness of some of the requirements of the ESRS. And if we're talking about um, a strategy or minimum disclosure requirements, in the case of minimum disclosure requirements or targets or or visa or opportunities, the BRM is going to be very help, helpful, but you will have to read the ESRS and you ha will have to digest ESRS because there is no out there any reporting framework, no DRI, no SASB that will tell you in this specific um, section of the ESRS called strategy, uh, this is what you have to do. No, this that, that, that doesn't exist. You will have to uh, probably... Uh, look at uh, different white papers that uh, organ different organizations have drafted. Um, you will probably have to consult with um, with subject matter experts, consultants. The deepness of some of the requirements of the SRS that are not really related to what you have to disclose, but with how you have to disclose it. This is something that you will have to um, understand. We are here to help you. But at some point, um, any tool in the market or in the industry has limitations uh, with the ESRS requirements. So um, that fantastic document of uh, a thousand, thousand, no, but hundreds uh, pages will have to be uh, digested in your own company, I'm afraid. Thank you, Maravi. Uh, and thank you all for replying to these questions. This is all the questions we have for today. Um, so maybe we can go to the what what's next um, slide. Thank you so much. One more second. All right, good. So what's next? Uh, we'll be sharing the recording of today's webinar with you via email. And additionally, the recording will also find its way to Cascale's YouTube channel. So make sure if you want to, um, you know, share it with your, with your colleagues or rewatch it, you will find it on YouTube. It will be embedded on our website and on our Cascale Connect, our members, members only platform. So it's uh, true, we covered a lot of ground in this webinar. So to help you pull out the key points and takeaways, keep also an eye uh, up for the HIC BRM white paper that was referenced throughout this webinar. And there will be a follow-up news update um, authored by a few of our speakers that will uh, also be made available as downloadable, uh, downloadable content. So many resources for you to uh, digest what we covered today. Um, of course, also the Wordly white paper that we shared in the chat. And also to make sure that you stay up to date, I also encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, I think they're going to drop the opt-in link in the chat. We would love you to opt-in to receive a policy and public affairs specific communications. Um, so that's on the chat. For only for Cascale members, um, you will find more resources and discussion threads relevant to today's content on Cascale Connect. And also there's going to be the link to register for the next HIG BRM office hours, which is scheduled for tomorrow, actually, June 13th. So run to Cascale Connect and um, register uh, for tomorrow's um, HIG BRM office hours. Uh, what's what's next? In September, you will be able to join us live at the Cascale Annual Meeting 2024 and also at Worldly's first ever customer forum. Uh, we're very, very excited to collaborate with our friends at Worldly to offer these events back to back September 9th to 12th in Munich, Germany. 
Uh, quick plug, we are excited to host a policy session during Cascale annual meeting to recap our Navigating Legislation and the HIC Index webinar series and to offer a forum for Cascale experts to present detailed tool updates and engage with uh, audience members. So unique opportunities to have the experts live on set and for you to interact with them and to listen, you know, um, flesh and bone uh, how tools will be updated uh, coming up. Um, also for Cascale members, friendly reminder that each member organization receives one complimentary ticket to attend the Cascale annual meeting. So do take advantage of this member benefit and I am looking forward to see you all there in Munich. Uh, you'll find again another link uh, to learn more and register for the annual meeting in the chat. Uh, also, if you have any questions related to combo ticket pricing, please contact our events team at events uh, at cascale.org. Uh, good. So thank you so, so much. I think we're done. Let's see. There's another slide. Ah, oh, yeah. There will be a next webinar in this series that will focus on the intersection of the HIC facility tools and key regulations. Almost missed that very important. Next uh, next uh, webinar in the series coming up. We will let you know when uh, the final date is set. So stay tuned. Now I think we're done with the slide. Thank you so, so much all for joining and see you very soon. Bye bye.